Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And today's date is the 7th of February, 2018, a Wednesday. And we are located at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library, where the interviews are conducted by Brian Powers, who is our cameraman today. And today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a World War II Marine Corps veteran, William F. Black. Mr. Black, it's a pleasure to meet you, and is it okay to call you Bill? Bill. Bill? Well, Bill, if you would, uh, where were you born and your date of birth? Augusta, Kentucky. It was uh, June the 5th, 1923. I see. And. Uh, what were your parents' names, Bill? Uh, my dad's name was William Lloyd Black. My mom's name was Dula Ann Cummings Black. I see. And I had uh, three brothers and four sisters. I see. Where'd you fit in on in that? I um, was uh, the seventh one. The seventh one? I have a younger brother. I see. And what'd your dad do for a living, Bill? He was a carpenter on the CNO Railroad. I see. Did he retire from the CNO? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't imagine with eight children, your mother had any outside jobs, did she? <laughs> no. Uh, no, you, she was pretty busy as a homemaker. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all live on a farm? No, we lived in Augusta. Right in town. Right in town. I see. We did live out in the country for a while after the 37 flood. It washed our house down the river about six miles. It, uh, it did, huh? Yeah, I it was, can, ended up in a big bottom down about six miles below Augusta. I see. And what'd y'all what'd, what'd do during the flood then? Where'd you, where we you? lived out, we went out in Germantown, Kentucky. That's up all... They had a, like a big hallway out there and they had the guys and you know and the boys there and then they had another unit in town for the women and uh, we actually went out the second floor window into a john boat to get a, when to you get, were in your home yeah when it was water was coming up what street were you on there we we lived on second street it just right off the river there then. yes yeah, so you could see the river from there yeah but uh and how long did it take you all to get moved into a regular home then after the 37 flood? Well, uh, we, we never did own a home. We rented all the time. I see. And we rented this house up on 2nd Street. I see. But where did you live after the flood, though? Yeah, on 2nd Street. Oh, you moved back to 2nd Street? Yes. We lived it. We were living in the railroad uh, they call Railroad Row. It was a bunch of houses that the railroad owned, uh -huh. and people who worked on the railroad could rent them, you know. I see. So we lived there, but that's the one that washed away. Yeah. And then, what home did you live in after you got settled in after the flood? Did you move back to Second Street? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. The railroad property again? No, it was, it was a private, privately owned house. We rented. <clears throat> what schools did you go to there? That's uh, that's Bracken County, isn't it? I mean, it was Augusta, Kentucky. Then it was just it was an independent school. Uh -huh. uh, I went as, as far as a sophomore in high school. So you went through grade school and then to sophomore. Uh, did you all belong to a certain church down there? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. I see. Is Mom it? made sure that I went to Sunday school every Sunday in church, every Sunday, but it didn't last. <laughs> I see. Uh, how long had your people been living in Augusta, Kentucky? Where was your grandparents from? Well, uh, John Clark was Mom's grandfather. He was a, a, an old Irish uh, boater who went up and down the Ohio River on the boats and dad's mom was a full-blown Cherokee she came down out of North Carolina with my grandfather what he, was what was her name uh, Sarah was her maiden her English name 
I never did know her Indian name. And she was a full-blooded Cherokee? I called up to the museum trying to get some background on her, but I, unless I knew her, her uh, Indian name, they couldn't help me. I see. But she was full-blooded Cherokee. And so your grandfather, Black, come out of North Carolina? Yes. I see. But, uh, they came down into the eastern part of Kentucky, up near the West Virginia border. And then they migrated on down into the valley mm -hmm. and uh, ended up in Augusta. Did you know your grandparents? I knew my grandmother. I see. And mom's, I knew mom's dad and mom, John oh. Cummins and Sarah Cummins. I see. Um, so you say uh, you, you dropped out of school in your sophomore year? Did mm -hmm. you finish your sophomore year? No, I just started. Just started? And, uh, I just didn't fit in with the, the learning group, I guess. And I, I went, actually, I went into the CCC camp. Oh, yeah. You, know, you remember those? Sure. I went to Lewistown, Montana for a year in a logging camp up there. What did you do up there? I <laughs> cut down trees. <laughs> uh, uh, did you all use a two-bit axe? Yes. I see. And then I, I wised up a little bit and I got on with a survey crew and I was chain man for a while and our, uh, uh, he wasn't, he was a civilian but he worked for the government, you know, surveying and he got something, an infection in his eye. So he taught me how to run a transit and he became the chain man and I did the surveying. We surveyed, uh, did contouring and surveyed uh, irrigation ditches and things like that. So that was pretty good. I see. Uh, How long did you do that? Uh, I was in the survey crew probably the last three or four months. I only was in the CC a year. Right. And then I came home, nothing, there was nothing there, no work of any kind. So, uh, I thought I'd join the Marines and see the world. <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, you were a pretty uh, stout fellow then at, at the Yeah, time I, of your I life. developed my upper body pretty good with that axe. How, I, how tall was you? I was up six two, mm -hmm. even in high school. I see. I played center on a on a basketball team. I see. And uh, I was a bean pole, only weighed about 150 pounds. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I developed some pretty good. When you were in the C the three C's, how much money did you all get paid a month? Thirty dollars a month. And what did they do with that money? Well, Mom got most of it. I sent it. Uh, uh, did you send it home, or did they send it home? Well, you you agreed to send so much to her. You know. Yeah. You uh, I think I sent twenty dollars a month to her, and I kept ten. Yeah, and uh, that would have been 1940 40 when you were in the three right. C's. Right. Right. There's a lot of money in those days. I mean, yeah, it, it was all right. Yeah. Enough to get a buy on. I a uh, couple of things. I, I learned to ski while I was up there. <laughs> yeah. I learned to roller skate. Yeah. So that was two of my accomplishments. Did you get involved in any sports up there in the 3C camp? No, uh, we did some boxing. I, we hear a lot about boxers in that camp. That's yeah. why I asked you that question. Yeah, we we uh, had the 16 ounce gloves. We'd check them out and get out there in the street and duke it out a little bit. Yeah. Any other sports you did there up at the 3C camps? Oh, that uh, the skiing was part of it. Yeah. Uh, and you were in Lewiston? Lewistown, Montana. Lewistown, Montana. It's right up next to Big Snowies, Little Snowies, and uh, uh, I forget the other mountain range. But it's, it's about, 100, about 100 miles from the Canadian border. Uh -huh. The year I was up here, it was, got 51 below zero. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, when it, it was snowing or too cold to work, well, we that's when we'd go out and ski. Yeah. Around the country, you know, and yeah. did some fishing. It had some trout up there, some rainbow. Uh -huh. And uh, they had, they called them rivers, but I thought they were creeks. They were only about 
20, 25 feet wide, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, we used to catch some trout once in a while. And it wasn't, wasn't a heck of a lot going on. That was a good way, though, in those days. It was one of the, Ro Ro Franklin Roosevelt started that program. And uh, yeah. one of the ways to keep you boys off the streets and keep you occupied. I'm glad they did, because uh, the crowd that I ran around with, half of them ended up in prison, and the other half got killed in car wrecks and what have you. Right. So I was, well, I, I credit the Marine Corps with saving me from yeah. being a, well, and uh, and being part of the three C's too. Help, yeah. help develop that, your that character. developed me. I had the military attitude when I went in the Marines, mm -hmm. and I could make my bunk the way they wanted it. You know, and they dropped a half dollar on it. If it didn't bounce, you had yeah. to. Oh, sergeant would rip it apart, and you'd have to do it all over. You had to do all that in the three C camp too. Yeah, uh, and uh, so uh, we don't hear a lot about that, but that was one of the better things that come out of the during the depression for you, young yes, guys. Yes, it was. It was. It was. We was, we had people from all over the country, yeah. New Jersey, New York, Chicago. Did you have any black people? No. No, it was just wasn't any black people. Uh -huh. in our camp. Right. I don't know why there wasn't, but we didn't have any black people. I see. Did you make any lasting friends uh, while you were there? Or? Well, I made one lasting enemy. <laughs> he came in one Saturday night about half drunk and he didn't like me anyway, so he just kicked my ass for nothing. You know, just for practice, he was uh, he was on the boxing team, uh, but I set him straight. Yeah. <laughs> I bought a knife, <laughs> one of those uh, Bowie type Bowie type knife. Yeah, and uh, one day they had you put pins in your laundry and took it to the laundry and they washed it and dried it and all that stuff. And he was the manager of the laundry, you know. So chow bell rang and everybody was gone but him and he was wanting to go to chow. And he said, oh, damn it, Black, come on, get this over with, you know. I walked around behind the thing and I pulled this blade out. And I said, I bought this especially for you. And I know where you sleep. If you ever look sideways at me again, I'm gonna cut your damn throat. <laughs> so that, that was pretty much what happened, you know. And he never, he never bothered me anymore. So, wh what was it? You had a like a contract. You spend one year in the three C's. Is yeah, that that? you could sign up. You could re-sign if you wanted to. You but I thought a year, year up there was long enough. Yeah. So the what, winters were terrible. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so w w you come back home then? Yes. How'd you get home? Well, by train. By train? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, where'd you, uh, where'd the train drop you off at? At Augusta. At Augusta? Yeah, I didn't have, uh, uh, there was nothing there, no jobs or anything. Yeah. And a friend of mine had joined the Marines and he was home on boot furlough, and he said, Bill, why don't you join the Marines? And I said, I never gave it a thought, but I might as well. So I went to Cincinnati, and, and uh, they uh, let me get in, you know, 17. I was supposed to be 18, but they said, well, if you get your parents' consent, we can admit you. Now, there's so, no war going on now. No. All right. This is we're technically still in peacetime. So yeah, go ahead. I didn't mean. And uh, he, uh, uh, I went home and mom signed it, and my brother signed my dad's name. <laughs> I went to Cincinnati and was transported down to Paris Island. Why'd you do that? There. Why'd your brother sign his name? Your dad. Well, dad was a uh, dad was on the road most oh, of the time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when uh, he came home on Friday. We sat, they sat down for the evening meal, and he said, where's Bill? And Mom said, he's at Paris Island. And he said, well, where in the hell is Paris Island? Mom said, it's a Marine Corps base. 
He said, what the hell is he doing in the Marines? And Mom said, well, he wanted to go. So he was a little perturbed about it, but when I came home on furlough, we walked around town, you know, and he was pretty proud. Yeah. So, so you, uh, after your brother and your mother signed the papers, you went back to Cincinnati. Yeah. Tell us, you know, how you... How would you go to Paris Island right away, or what? Yeah, uh huh. The same day. We, you, well, we stayed at a motel that night and left the next morning to Beaufort, South Carolina, and then transported over to uh, Paris Island. You, did you travel by bus or what? Uh, train. Oh, you went by train to Beaufort. Mm -hmm. And from Beaufort, uh, they took you uh, on with the uh, tell trucks, us, you know, and yeah. took us to uh, over there and. First thing we did was get her hair all cut off. <laughs> well, did they greet you when you got off the bus? Yeah, very strongly. Tell us about that. Well, we had a corporal and a sergeant, our, our drill instructors, and uh, uh, they laid the law down how they want things done, and you damn well better do it. Because back then, the, uh, the DI could knock you on your butt. It did, if, if you give them any crap, they take you around behind a mess hall and kick crap out of you. Yeah, that, that was pretty rough back there. But tell us about your basic training. Okay, I, I, uh, I was uh, uh, better than the average Marine, I guess. Uh, I did, uh, he was punishing us one day, the sergeant was, had us on a parade field at, at attention. And this was July and August in South Carolina. And them sand fleas was having a picnic on us, you know. And uh, like that, he said, black ball out. Give me some high ports around the mess hall. I had to go 03. Uh, and then someone said, and I run around and around, around that mess hall. Finally, I come around and I grounded it and I saluted him. I said, I'm not running anymore. He said, who in the hell said so? I said, I said so. He said, you want to go to the brig? I said, I don't care where the hell I go, but I ain't running no more. He said, fall in and shut up. <laughs> well, for when I got through boot camp. people listening, when you said you were running with an 03, that's a, a Springfield yes. 03 model. Yes. 30 odd six. Sure was. Yeah. So he let you slide on. Yeah. You, uh, when I graduated, got my anchor, crown and anchor, uh, I, I was stationed at Paris Island for about three months. And so when he gave me my crown and anchor, he said, come down to Slopsy tonight and we'll drink some suds, you know. So I went down there and sat down with him and another guy. He said, you little skinny son of a bitch. <laughs> You're the only one that ever told me no and got away with it. <laughs> So we drank some beer and you, you remember know, his name? And I fit right in, you know. Uh, then I went to uh, New River to Camp Lejeune and we were attached to the 1st Marine Division up there. We were the 3rd Marine Regiment and uh, then they pulled out, went to the coast and actually they ended up on Guadalcanal. But we went from there to San Francisco and boarded a, a big old converted luxury liner called the SS Lure Line. And we went, we anchored in uh, the harbor, of Pearl Harbor, but we didn't get to go ashore. But we went from there then to Samoa, American Samoa. We believed the 8th Marines there, and we garrisoned uh, Samoa for almost 10 months. That uh, drill instructor, do you remember his name? No. Oh. Was, I, think, I think it was a common name like Smith, Sergeant Smith. We didn't know his first name. I see. I see. <laughs> now, you're, what outfit are you in now that you went on the lure line and to Samoa? I mean, are you in a... The 3rd Marine Regiment. And what division? Any d we wasn't in a division yet. Okay. We were just an independent you know, uh, regiment. Are you trained now as a rifleman? Or? Yes. Okay. Uh, one accomplishment that I uh, 
like to tell people about. We qualified at a thousand yards with that O3. Had it the, all the way up on a leaf site, you know. 18 inch bulls, I look like a match head down there. And I qualified expert, so. You know, I was, I was born and raised in Kentucky. Hell, I was around guns all my life, you know. Yeah. And one one sad experience I'll tell you about. I always put my thumb over the comb of the stock when I was shooting. He told us, he told us very deliberately, do not put your thumb over the comb of the stock. Well, you know, have it. I wore a black eye for about a week. I damn think come back and my thumb hit me in the eye and <laughs> that, but, yeah, that was of one of the learning experiences. Yeah. When, you, when you're on Samoa though are you still carrying an 03? Yes. No we, we when we went down there we had the M1s in. Oh the M1 Grand. Yeah and yeah. we swapped with the 8th Marines they still had the 03s and we swapped with them and then later on we got M1s back and Actually, I got a carbine, a little 30 caliber carbine. Mm -hmm. I was in headquarters company. Uh, and uh, what was your, what were your duties there on Samoa? Uh, well, we stood guard. You know, we had a couple pillboxes up on a hill, and we would do guard duty at night. You know, and, and uh, I was a runner. I took the like the morning report up to battalion and. I was just a jack of all trades. I was a mail clerk, <laughs> but just anything that there were, needed there to were, be done. There, were, there wasn't any uh, combat uh, there. No. Uh, uh, I forgot to ask you one question, and we ask this to everybody, though. Uh, you remember where you were on Pearl Harbor Day and how you heard about the, the Japanese? I was, I was a parasol on my bunk. I had come off guard duty. <clears throat> no, I was on the... Uh, we did four on and four off, and I had just did uh, the 12 to 4, and I was laying on my bunk, and uh, the radio was playing, and they interrupted it and said that Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Then Roosevelt came on with his speech, mm -hmm. and I said, well, I guess, it, pardon my English, shit to hit some hand, because I knew then we were at war. Right. And uh, it was kind of a shock, but uh, when, like I say, I shipped out to New River, and we trained up there. We did amphibious, tra we landed on Winslow Beach about three times. We had to run the people off the beach when we was coming in in, in the Higgins boat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Where's we, Winslow Beach at? It's, it's in, uh, next to Jacksonville, North Carolina. Okay. And you did three uh, practice landings? Yeah, uh-huh. We, uh, we had open gate liberty up there. It was kind of nice. I mean, we, went, we spent a lot of weekends in Kinston, North Carolina. And we found a couple of the ladies' colleges. <laughs> and we started hanging around there. <laughs> now, it's three young bucks, you know, we just, we just out for a good time. Uh, and, but uh, and you're still 17 years old now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I got I was 18 on Samoa. Right. In September of. You got in Samoa in September of 42. Yes. And you yeah you turned 18 on June the 5th. And uh, so how long did you all stay there on Samoa? It was almost 10 months. Almost 10 months. Then uh, we were relieved there by then by the army. They sent in a, a company of uh, soldiers, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, then we went from there to Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, I can tell you an experience we had on the way down. Yeah. We lost a rudder off the ship. And we went off course and raked another ship. And we thought we'd been torpedoed. They, Batting down all the hatches, you know, and we were down in there. We we didn't sleep the rest of the night. And the all engines stopped, you know, and I thought, we've been torpedoed, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, nothing happened. So come daylight, they opened the hatches, and we went topside. 
the convoy had gone on, and we were sitting out there like a big plum <laughs> with two little DEs going back and forth running the sub watch for us. They rigged us temporary. Uh, well, they ran into another ship? Yeah, we went, we actually raked this other ship, knocked some of the lifeboats off and stuff, you know. It, we hit them pretty good because mm -hmm. it shook the whole ship when we hit. Yeah, because you had lost the rudder. Well, how'd y'all maneuver then from? We just stopped and they actually dropped anchor because we was, we were over a coral reef, more or less. It was only probably 20 or 30 fathoms in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in these swells. Man, I'm telling you, you couldn't even see them little DE sometime and go down in the trough and it was out of sight. So you can imagine sit, uh, standing in the mess hall trying to eat. You'd hold on to the table and you'd hold on to your tray. And you'd wait for it to hit the top, get a couple of bites, then hold on again because and there were sailors and marines both feeding the fish. Oh, everybody got seasick. <laughs> Them damn rollers. <laughs> well, anyway, we got that finished and uh, got the new rudder on, temporary rudder. We went on into Auckland. We was about a day late getting there. And, and that's uh, in New Zealand. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we uh, stayed aboard ship that night. Some of us did. I, again, you know, I was on the detail to go out to make the tents ready for occupancy, you know. Now we had left Samoa where the weather was normally about 90 to 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. We hit New Zealand in July, it was a dead winter, <laughs> and we like to froze our butt off. They actually uh, reconnoitered a bunch of long johns for us to put on, because man, we were freezing to death. Our skin, you know, our blood was thin from all the tropical mm -hmm. exposure. Well, anyway, we had trained and went out to a little old village called Pui Nui. Pui Nui. <laughs> Pui Nui. It was about 15 miles out of Auckland. And uh, we joined the 12th Marines and the uh, 21st Marines and formed up the 3rd Marine Division. The 12th and? Uh... And 21st. 12th and 21st and 3rd, that made the three uh, regiments right. of and the 3rd uh, Marine <clears throat> Division. Yes, yeah. and we were only there about maybe six weeks. Back aboard ship and sailed up to Water Canal. While you were in, New, uh, in uh, New Zealand, did you get into any of the towns and villages? Uh, no, we, we didn't. Uh, we went into Auckland quite often. Because we had open, open gate liberty, you know. And uh, in fact, one of our biggest battles was at, on Queens Avenue in Auckland. The Kiwi Division had come home from Africa, and we had moved in all 100 ladies and everything, you know. So it was about six blocks, <laughs> brawl, just a brawl. And uh, it was all Kiwis and Marines and sailors. Now, Kiwis, what do you mean by that? That was the name of their division. Were they... Uh, Aussies. Aussies. And, yeah. and New Zealanders. I see, see. And you know, in that damn melee, three Marines were killed. Oh, is that right? Knifed. So, the next weekend, uh, our colonel said, well, it's open gate liberty. He said, ain't nobody going to check. He said, if you want to take your forty-five, if you got one, or take your K-bar with you. He said, uh, if they want to play games, we can play games too. Well, they had actually barred the Kiwi Division out of Auckland in our favor. And we had the whole town to ourselves again, you know. And we had, uh, we had some nice people down there. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. I don't but, think we've ever heard that about three Marines being killed there, though. Yeah, they were killed in the, in that damn brawl. They were knifed because the, these Kiwis had their knives with them, uh -huh. and uh, we we didn't expect anything like that, you know. Right. When it started, it just became a big melee, you know, about six blocks, and uh, you'd look around and see who was the most 
Americans on one side, you that you go to that side, you know, and they broke it up by driving trucks through it. Believe it or not, they drove the big trucks through the middle of the street, and and then you went to whichever side had the most Americans on it, you know. Right. And uh, uh, but the next Saturday we were prepared. I think about every one of us had a K bar, or, and the officer, sergeants had their forty fives. You know, we was gonna even the score, you know. <laughs> but there was nobody there to even it with. They they were all barred out of the city. Now, can you imagine that was their hometown? Yeah, my goodness. But they, in lieu of us, they made them, it restricted Auckland to the uh, Kiwi Division. Uh, so from uh, from there, where did you go? To Guadalcanal. To Gua all three regiments and third division. Yes. And uh, we trained on uh, Guadalcanal. Were you in the the uh, first invasion on Guadalcanal? Oh no, no. We just got did some scouting. We got bombed a few times because uh, we were right next to Henderson Field. What, when was it that you hit uh, Guadalcanal? Then? Do you remember uh, the month? Oh, it was. I'd say late '43. Okay. And what's your duties on Guadalcanal then? We just trained. We had, you know, had a lot of guys. We just trained in uh, amphibious landings and did some patrol work. And uh, we uh, tell us about Guadalcanal then. The, well, it the it was uh, and the, the people. We uh, we went on outpost one time. Uh, a company of us, a company of our outfit. We went out there where uh, near that, uh, can't think of the river, that that's where they had the big battle of Japanese landing behind this river. I uh, mm -hmm. can't think of the name of it, but that's where the Marines and them really had a, a wing ding. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we trained there for a while, and then we went to Bougainville, which is, I never understood why we landed on Bougainville, because it had no strategic value that I knew of, although they did build an airstrip on it. The, the uh, CVs came in and built an airstrip. But we had a hell of a time on Bougainville. I mean, we ran into more than we, the, somebody had scouted them wrong or something because we caught hell. <laughs> We were pinned on the beach about three days, mm. and uh, what what period of time is this that you're on Bougainville? Well, I guess it was must have been about the early part of '44. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember, uh, you know, the right. dates and everything, but uh, we uh, went in in single file on Higgins boats. Then when we got about a mile off the shore, we flanked, you know, and hell, it was, they had these weapons, these old 77s, right at the water line, and they sank about three of our uh, PT, I mean, our uh, Higgins. Higgins boats, mm -hmm. and you see Marines swimming around in, in the ocean, you know, trying to get to shore. We went down the old carbonet, that was the, off we was it. on the AP's end, and, uh, we, like I say, we had it pretty rough. Uh, uh, then we started, there was, they had a, about 20 pillboxes built back in the jungle, in the edge of the jungle. And we got, like, we were getting a lot of sniper fire from there, you know, and so we, we decided to clean these pillboxes out. And uh, uh, that was my first experience. Uh, I was in. I went in. We went in twos. Two people to each pillbox. Walked in. Was you had to squat because the Japanese were sharp people, and, and you couldn't stand upright. So you was kind of in a crouch, you know. And I went down on one knee, and I was looking around. There was a lot of dead bodies in there. And I. I always had good peripheral vision, and I saw a movement in the corner of this pillbox. They were probably about 20 feet square, you know. And this guy 
raised a little trap door up, stuck his head up, and I'm as close as me to that chair, about eight feet from him, and I already had my weapon lined up. He stuck his head up out there and I nailed him. <laughs> he fell back in the hole, so I jumped up and grabbed a, pulled a grenade and pulled a pin, raised that trap door up and throw it down and run like hell, you know, got out of there. And then there was a guy standing there with a flamethrower. And I said, why don't you uh, give him a shot through the gun port there and see if there's anybody else in there alive. Well, two guys come out of there running out of there on fire. They were burning like candles and screaming. And their ammunition was going off in their belt. It was burning that, that hot. And some guy shot them and, and uh, put them out of their misery. I said, mm -hmm. why the hell didn't you just let them burn? I, I, I developed a hell of an attitude. <laughs> yeah. I swear, uh, that's why I think I lost my religion. Because <laughs> I enjoyed killing the bastard. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but uh, every time you turn around, you were in a situation where it was easy to shoot first or, you know. Or be uh, shot. Yeah. And uh, I walked by a couple of them and they raised up behind me. And a sergeant on my right had a Thompson he'd picked up on the beach and uh, he mowed him down pretty good. He said, Black, he said, them so much that about had you in your sights. And I said, well, that's the last time I'm walking by one that looked like he's still alive. So we just, we had plenty of ammunition. So if the summits didn't, wasn't bloody or blowed in half or something, you just walk up and shoot him in the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you knew he wasn't going to get up behind you. Mm -hmm. And now that's kind of brutal, but that's the way it was. Yeah. And uh, when then about after we got the pillboxes cleaned out, we walked through a big old swamp about maybe 200 yards wide, you know, and water about up to your armpits. And we we came out on the other side, and we came up on a knoll about a 15 foot rise out of the swamp, and it dropped off to a big field. Well, that's where we set up, dug in, and uh, we uh, had some guys try to infiltrate at night. You know, we had a few guys that we had to, we had flare, we'd shoot a flare up and, you know, machine gun would open up and open, well, you know, knock them down. Well, anyhow, uh, one morning, about eight o'clock, there was a big, this big field out in front of us, about like two football fields, you know, big wide field. And here come about 200 <laughs> of the Japanese Imperial Marines. And the officers and NCOs had their sabers out and they would all hold banzai, banzai. They ran into the strongest point in our, we had three machine guns there two air cooled and one water cooled. And the 21st was on our flank and they had a machine gun up there. So within about 75 feet, there was four machine guns. And that poor stupid bastard just kept coming and we just kept mowing them down and they was crawling over top of each other. Still screaming, banzai, banzai. Well, it wasn't a damn one of them got within 100 yards of us. Uh, and uh, we we figured it was about 200 and some people in the group. And uh, so uh, an intelligence officer came up and one of the officers laying out in the middle of the field had a, a map case on him. And he said, I'd like to have that map case. Well, you know, you forget protocol. I said, well, why in the hell don't you go out there and get it? <laughs> he said, I'd like to have some volunteers. And I said, well, I'm pretty stupid. I'll volunteer. And so me and three other guys went out to recover this map case. I was walking out through there, and this guy was laying over a little Nambu machine gun. He wasn't dead. He raised up, looked me right in the eye about from here to that 
bookcase there. And if you ever had someone look at you with so much hate, it's almost a physical impact. And I was looking eyeball to eyeball, and I had barred on it, uh, BAR to go out there. The guy didn't clean it too good, so I swung it around and got off one round, and the damn thing jammed. Well, I said, well, my ass is grass again. And uh, the sergeant with that Thompson, he just moved him away from that gun. He, them 45 just tore him up. So that was another incident when I said, well, here are right, angel's wings any time now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we went out and I cut the case off and, and brought it back to the second lieutenant. And uh, we, uh, stayed, we stayed there about, oh, probably three weeks. And uh, we got relieved by uh, a ranger battalion, army rangers. And we got moved back to the beach, and uh, we was uh, at, on the beach at Bougainville. Yeah. yeah. And uh, these guys had these hammocks that you hang from the trees, you know, with the mosquito net built in and everything. Well, hell, the guys were swapping savers and everything for them damn hammocks, you know, to get out of the mud, you know. Old Charlie came over and dropped a couple. And there was the anti personnel, the ones with the stems. Oh, Charlie, on them. you mean bed check, Charlie? Yeah. And uh, next morning, two Marines looked like hamburger. You couldn't give them hammocks away after that. Yeah. No, we went back in a hole. <laughs> but uh, I got wounded with shrapnel on Bougainville. Uh, a, tree, a tree burst, a mortar round, landed in one of them big old banyan trees, and that just came down and I was in my hole and uh, I was laying like this with my head down and a piece of shrapnel hit me on the arm. Just a flesh wound but it, it hit the nerve. My whole damn arm just went numb. And I, I asked my buddy, I said, is my right arm still there? <laughs> he said, what the hell is wrong with you, Black? I said, I can't feel the damn thing, it's, it's numb. and. Uh, he said, well, that's still there, and I, I looked, and my arm was still there. So when when all this stuff quit, I took my K-bar and I dug that piece of sprout and went out of the ground. It was about that long, about the size of your finger. And he said, just hit just deep enough to hit the nerve and went in the ground. It was still hot. <laughs> it was still hot from the explosion, I guess. Uh, that was one of the experiences. Uh, uh, but uh, we pulled back on the beach and they brought in some beer over near a club, that West Coast beer, you know, what it was kind? warm, we're near a club beer. Mm -hmm. We got two cans a piece and about, you know, made you drunk because you hadn't had, had anything to drink for a long time. So we sitting there playing some cards around a fire. And we crawled in her hole, and I had a, uh, my poncho up over uh, some combat wire to keep the, you know, the uh, dew off. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the ground started shaking. I stood up and it shook me down, and there was coconuts raining down like I did, uh, like, you know, uh, raindrops. We had a damnedest earthquake. It lasted almost two minutes, yes. and uh, coconuts just came. Man, you had to get away from the trees if you could, because sure. uh, uh, if one of them damn coconuts hits you, damn you, kill you. Yeah. And uh, we had quite an experience there. And then, uh, like I say, we got relieved, and we walked back down the beach and got aboard ship and went back to Guadalcanal, and uh, uh, we. How many men did you lose there in Bougainville? Uh, I'd say uh, probably 30 percent of the of, the, uh, of our company. I don't know how the other divisions made out, uh, the other sections, but I'd say we lost about 30 percent because there was a lot of snipers uh, working the area.
and uh, I was just plain ass lucky, you know. And so how how long did your arm stay in motion? Oh, just a few minutes. Oh, okay. And then I started flexing it, you know, and I said, well, and I took my blouse off, and it was a hole through it, and just a mm -hmm. flesh wound on the inside of my arm. What did you do with the piece of shrapnel? I carried it for a long time, but I don't know whatever happened to it. Yeah. And uh, so you got back on a, a ship. Yeah. <clears throat> went back to Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm. And then we re-outfitted. I mean, they sent in a bunch of recruits, you know, and we was training them. I'll tell you an experience here. Uh, they were showing them how to use combat weapons. And they were using this O3 for showing, you know, how to fire a rifle grenade. <laughs> we didn't have any uh, uh, dum dum, so they took a bullet out of the damn casing and put soap in it, you know. And this lieutenant put it in the O3 and put the bolt shut pointed that rifle up in the air and he shot that damn grenade and went about 15 feet in the air. Shit, we were gone. We were like quail, man. We, we ran over those poor replacements. They, they was thinking about moving and we were already <laughs> leaving the scene, you know. So I went out in the jungle and things calmed down. And, well, we went back in this big clearing, sat down in a big circle again and they brought up a 61 millimeter mortar. If you're going to show them how to fire the how the mortar worked, well, they set their base plate all right. There was a an old abandoned pillbox down, maybe 500 yards, maybe, and they set their base plate. Everything was fine. Dropped a shell in the damn mortar, and it didn't come out. It stayed in. <laughs> we were gone again. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to get killed with some silly so much, you know, making a mistake. Right. Uh, so I just stayed out in the jungle till the thing was over and uh, I was out there sitting on a log and the first sergeant come walking out here and he said, Black, what the hell are you doing out here? I said, staying alive. What are you doing out here? He said the same damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> We'd both been through Bougainville and, uh, you know, we slept in the same hole and everything. I was at headquarters. And uh, so then we, trained there and headed to Guam. Well, we went up, we were floating reserve for the second, first and second division hit uh, Saipan Tinian. So we cruised around the islands and we got a wake up call every morning and every night. Uh, we went to general quarters and a couple of torpedo planes came in, you know, and tried to score a hit. Well, uh, one thing you say, we was on the LSTs in, and they, there was a hell of a lot of firepower uh, and aircraft, machine guns. They had welded uh, stations on the deck, you know, and mm -hmm. 50 caliber machine guns. They had tracers, about every third one. And this goddamn one plane, though, he, uh, he dropped down to just where he was clearing the ships. Maybe a hundred feet up. And I saw him drop the torpedo. Now you can imagine. He's about, oh, a couple hundred yards from me, and I see that damn torpedo drop into the water. And it's coming right toward us. And we had aviation gasoline covering the whole forward end of that damn LST. Double stacked aviation gasoline. And the armory, the uh, magazine was in the forward part of the ship. Well, everybody was going down below, you know, and I'm running around on the deck, and this uh, this Navy officer said, what's your job? And I said, I'm an ammunition passer. I uh, wasn't passing no ammunition, but I didn't want to be down in that damn hole if, if it got hit. Well, this torpedo came through the water, and a little LCI pulled up, and it blew that summit in half. It blew that little boat in half, killed 11 sailors, and uh, they let it drift aft, and they sent a destroyer back there and finished sinking it. Uh, but 
I knew there was no need to go to the other, other side of the ship. If that torpedo hit us, we'd have been a Roman candle. So anyway, uh, got through that, and uh, they took Saipan Tinian reasonably easy, and uh, so then we went on up to Guam, and uh, we uh, that's where we went. It was the first time we had ever landed in the. Uh, uh, amphibian tanks, and uh, we got. Did you ride a tank in? Yeah. And, uh, and that come right <clears throat> off the LST. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They just dropped the front end of it, and mm -hmm. they just rolled out and yeah. hit the water. It was when they were in the water. It was only probably fourteen inches or eighteen inches sticking up out of the water because it was all you know it was down below. It was pretty, pretty safe. And they they didn't fire a damn shot at us, you know. At first, I was in A Company, A and C Company was the assault company, and then B Company was the reserve. And uh, <coughs> we went went ashore, started up this hill, at about a 45 degree angle, Red Beach One. I know I remember it very well, <laughs> and shit, we lost 90 percent of our troop going up that hill. I was one of the ones that got shot in that assault. And I, I wasn't on Guam in about 10 minutes <laughs> before I got nailed. And uh, I got shot in my chest. And I played possum for a while. Firefight died down and I said, well, maybe I can get out of here. I started sneaking down the hill and somebody shot me through the shoulder. <laughs> my right arm was useless. You can imagine. And I was spurting blood out of my damn chest like like a drinking fountain. I put my thumb in it, <laughs> stopped the blood. And uh, uh, when he shot me the second time, I just straightened out, and rolled down a damn hill, and I hit the bottom. There was a little gully down there, and I got I got in that. And I said, you know, if I don't get out of here and get some help, I'm probably going to die. You know. That's what I, that was my thinking. And there was no way I was going to crawl with my right arm completely useless. So you, uh, got, you got hit here? Yeah, I got shot in the chest. And then? It went through uh, my diaphragm down behind my hip. I still got it in there. And, then you, got, and you got hit in the back again? Yeah, I got shot through the shoulder. and came down and it wedged right under the skin. You, you could see the damn slug under my skin. And, uh, are, you, are you still holding your thumb in your... Well, I picked my right arm up and used my right thumb to stop the hole. <laughs> and uh, when I got to the bottom of the hill, I said, well, if I don't get out of here and get some help, I, I'm not going to make it. So I just stood up and walked about maybe 100 feet back to the beach. And shit, I heard them going by. <laughs> you hurt your ears, they're so damn close, you know. I said, well, just hit me in the back of the head and get this shit over with. That's the way that was my philosophy. I just said, man, if it happens, it happens. So I walked back to the beach, sat down, I could not move. All the adrenaline was gone. So I sat there, leaning against an old tree stump. And uh, they was landing, they was bringing in supplies. There's another incident that uh, I died a thousand times. I, there was a box of grenades sitting there on the beach, and they brought in these L L LCIs that had the tanks on them. And I'll be damned if that tank didn't run over that box of grenades, and they just scattered, they'd cover this room. And I said, don't start smoking, because <laughs> I couldn't move. I was just paralyzed. They had done them, went off. And I sat there a few minutes, and uh, one of these tanks came up and got between me and the hill. Uh, you could hear a few rounds hitting the damn tank. And the guy was in there, had these little slits, you know, and he's, in, he's going like this. And I, I just shook my head. So two of them jumped out and just bodily threw me in the damn tank. And we headed <laughs> across the coral reef. And, and they were splashing water in that damn thing. They was, you know, water, the hits were, mortar rounds was falling so close it water was coming in the tank. Are you on the outside of the tank? Or no, I was in it, in inside. It. I said, 
my philosophy was, I said, am I going to get off this damn island alive? You know, well, we headed out, and about three miles out was this big white ship with a red cross on it. I said, damn, if I get there, maybe I can, you know. So they horsed us aboard with any wire baskets. And uh, I was sitting there in a chair. You still got your thumb in the... Yeah, well, I had a, a bandage on it then. Uh, a corpsman had come up on the beach and put a 4 by 4 I put some soft nail mod powder on it, and, and, uh, and he... Uh, cut my uniform open and put a bandage on my shoulder. It had went in, but it never came out. It was still in here and laying in under my skin. And uh, uh, so I was sitting there in the chair and I was getting a little woozy because I'd lost a lot of blood. And uh, this doctor was running around there and I said, Doc, somebody better take a look at me. And he said, well, we've got to take care of the more seriously wounded first. He thought I'd just been shot in the shoulder. I pulled my blouse out and I said, how about this one in my chest? And he yelled for the corpsman and they took me down to the OR. And I was, I had been sitting so long, it tore my diaphragm up, the bullet did, and I couldn't straighten out. So two corpsmen got hold, one got hold of my shoulder, and one got hold of my feet, and bodily stretched me out on the damn operating table. Oh, it, it, it hurt pretty good. And another corpsman come up with a bottle of methylate, can you imagine, and poured that hole full. My ass come off that table about that high. If I was able, I'd have got up and started swinging. <laughs> But uh, the corpsman had given me a, a shot of morphine on the beach. And as soon as they, they, then they set me up and taped me from my waist, from my hips up to my armpit with uh, two inch strips of adhesive because they thought that might have hit my lung. And uh, so they gave me another shot of morphine and took me to, I, I didn't even know when I hit, when I went to the bunk, when they put me in the, the bunk board, you know, in the hospital uh, ward. I didn't even know when they put me in there because I slept, I guess, 24 hours. And uh, I woke up and this corpsman standing there hitting me on the, on the leg. He said, hey, Marine, are you hungry? I said, I could eat a damn skunk. <laughs> so he had a, a tray, now I believe it's fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, green beans, and a carton of milk. Man, I, I said, you want me to kiss you now or later? <laughs> so we was on that ship about, oh, three days, I guess. We sailed down to New Hebrides, and I went to the Naval Hospital there. And about the second day, they took me to the OR and they just took a scalpel and sliced over that bullet and they took it out and the doctor said, would you like us for a sea in there? I said, I would. So he gave me the bullet. And uh, about then a corpsman came in and cut a strip up under my arm and he said, there's no easy way to do this. <laughs> Pluck me like a chicken. Oh, I mean, he pulled every hair out of my body with that damn tape, you know. Oh, that smarted. So I went back to the ward. He took me back to the ward. And this nurse came around with an alcohol swab and started taking the residue off, you know, the tape residue. And then she said, oh, I'll give you a, a bed bath because I was still pretty messed up. And uh, I said, okay. So I'm laying there on my stomach. She washed me real nice with warm water, you know. And she was a good looking little girl from Louisville, Kentucky. Little black headed nurse. And uh, she said, roll over. And I said, I can't. And she said, well, I got to do the front. And I said, I can't roll over because I had an erection. It wouldn't stop, you know. So she said, damn it, roll over. And I rolled over. She went, bing. And then, 
So she gave me a bath and re, you know rebandaged me and everything. So I kept exercising my arm, you know, while I was in my bunk, and I got my use of my arm back about ten days. And uh, so the third air wing was going up to Guam, and they were giving all their supplies back to the Navy. So we went up there and we didn't have any money. Me and my buddy, he he had lost a hand. He had his hand amputated right there and they pulled a skin down around it and put a sandbag on it to keep that skin down there where it would grow around the bone. So we went up to the third air wing and we told him, we said, man, we'd like to have some beer, but we ain't got any money. And the guy said, don't worry about it. He gave us a case of blue ribbon and we walked back out and down the road a little piece and got south of the bank and we started drinking that blue ribbon, you know, and we drank all oh, four or five cans a piece, you know. So it was getting dark and uh, we said, well, we'll go back to the ward, you know, and we put the rest of the beer in our blouse, you know. So we walked into <laughs> the ward, the lights were out and, you know, it was after 10 o'clock and all the lights were out and old Kaiser, <laughs> He fell down. He stumbled and fell down and beer went all over the ward. <laughs> Lights came on and here came two corpsmen and a nurse down there and he was swinging the sandbag at him. He said, I'm going to sandbag you. And I, I was just leaning up against the wall crying, laughing so hard. And uh, so the next morning when the doctor came through, you had to stand at the end of your bunk, you know. And he ripped it four or four off and I had a little proud flesh coming through that hole. He said go to OR let him burn that off. And he used some kind of acid to burn it off and they put a, he said uh, you're ready for combat I'll send you back up to Guam. So next day I was on me and two other Marines were on a boat back up to Guam. <laughs> Where were you at when when this happened though? What? Were you when you had spilled the beer in the... Uh, in oh, that was on New Hebrides. New Hebrides, okay. Uh, so Naval Hospital. And so how long is this that they said they're going to put you back in Guam? How many days would you say it is? Or Probably week? three weeks, four weeks maybe. And they're going to send you on back up to Guam again? I was still leaking. I was still leaking out that damn hole. That doctor said, well, if you're, if you're ready for combat, we'll send you back up to Guam. So we got back up there and uh, I walked in uh, uh, Sergeant Major's tent. He was sitting there and, and I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, Sergeant, I'm back. He looked around and said, Black, you ain't back. You're dead. said, I've done sent your records back to Pearl Harbor. Mom had gotten a telegram that I was killed in action. Oh, it was a mess. And uh, I said, well, I, I don't look dead, do I? You silly son of a bitch. And he said, <laughs> I guess you're not. <laughs> well, we about, oh, about maybe 10 days on Guam, we decided to make a cleanup sweep. So we sealed some caves, you know, and blowing them shut. And about the third day out, I got malaria again, and they sent a jeep up and hauled me back to one of the mobile hospitals. And, uh, about three days in there with some quinine and orange juice and I got so I could walk. I walked back to our tent area and uh, I walked in the uh, headquarters tent. Everybody had gone to chow. The phone rang and I answered it. Sergeant Major over at battalion headquarters. He said, Black, all the original third is going home in the morning at six o'clock. So I never did go back to the hospital. I was out there with a sea bag pack, just like it was six of us left out of 218. Yeah, pretty rough. I don't think, ever, you know, weren't all killed, but wounded seriously enough to be sent home. Yeah. Well, we had quite a quite a deal. Do you remember that date? No, but it was. It had to be in '45. Because uh, when I got sent home on Navy rotation, 
I had like 68 points and you needed 50 some and they sent me home because I'd, I'd been wounded twice and uh, had been overseas almost two years. So I got to come home on the Navy rotation. And uh, so we went to we went out and got on a aircraft carrier and went to Pearl Harbor. You remember the aircraft carrier? Uh, no, it was a, one of the big ones though. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was like a damn ship, like a city. Mm -hmm. Man, it was, they was playing ball out there on the deck, you know. Yeah. So you went on an aircraft carrier from Guam? To we, we went, we, we were supposed to go stateside, but they got a call back up there because the Japanese had landed a counter force on the other side of the island. And they had to go back up, so they dumped us in Pearl Harbor. And uh, they wouldn't let us leave the stockade. They put us in a stockade, believe it or not, that they had used for the Japanese during, you know, the, mm -hmm. the series of operations down there. So this we stayed on, at, yeah, on Pearl Harbor now. Yeah, we stayed in a stockade and they brought our lunch in, our meals in to us and everything. About three days they said, well, grab your sea bags, you got transportation. So we went down to the beach in a truck and got aboard an old Dutch freighter. And they put us all the way down in the bottom hole. And there was about six inches of sludge running back and forth across the bottom of the ship, you know. And I said, I'm not staying down here in this shit. Now there was two sergeants in this six of us. They should have made, been the initiative, you know. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going topside and get this shit straightened out. So we still had our weapons, our weapons, you know, I had an M1 then, and we had them, uh, I don't think anybody had any ammunition, but we had our, our M1s. So we went up the damn stairwell and went on board on topside and we walked down to officer's quarters and there was a young soldier there in nice clean khaki and a white helmet and he said, I'm supposed to stop you, I'm not supposed to let you guys go up there. But he said, I'll be damned if I'm going to stop you. He said, in fact, be my guest and uh, well, we talked with one of the mates that could speak English and we told him, we said, I told him, you know, I took the initiative, I said, you got us down there in a shithole, and the, the damn reefers was leaking uh, the uh, chlorine. It was, it was no reason for the ship was empty. And he said, "Well, pick out wherever you want to stay and move in there." So we went down one deck and had pads on the bed and everything, you know. So we, we lived it up going into San Diego, but. Uh, a day out of San Diego, I came down with malaria again, and I went to the hospital, and they went up to the uh, Marine Corps base here at San Diego. I never did get to see them, you know, when they deployed wherever they went, because I was in the damn, they wouldn't let me out of the hospital. I had that, they call it malaria BT, it's recurrent malaria. So. Um, they were getting ready to, uh, I did keep in communication with them, and uh, they were getting ready to be deployed, you know, wherever they was going. I took my hat and my tie, stuck them in my shirt, and I went over the fence. <laughs> so I caught a bus up to San Diego Marine Base, you know. I walked up to the gate, and this asshole, I don't know, I would never forgive him. He, I said, I'm here, I want to see my buddies before they scatter out all over the country. He said, you got a Liberty Pass? I said, no. I've got my dog tags. He said, well, anybody could be wearing dog tags. I said, bullshit. I said, uh, PFC, 3rd Marine Division, just got back, back to the States. Called the Corporal of the Guard. They hauled my ass back down to the hospital, put me in the brig. <laughs> So they said, well, he can't stay in here, it's damp. 
So I spent 10 days in the K ward where they had the nuts. And I'm telling you, if that wasn't an experience, you just back up in the corner and they just fall out in the middle of the floor, having, you know, uh, the conniptions, you know, and uh, they would just they'd go around pushing little cars on the floor. And it was a nut house, you know. Military. I, yeah, and I was in there 10 days for jumping the fence, you know, going AWOL. And uh, so when I got out of there, I got my furlough delaying route to uh, Paris Island and went home. What, uh, what, what time of frame is that when, when you got to go to Paris Island? Oh, it was just you, normal. I mean, what, what month or year? Oh, it was damn close to, it was in uh, uh, about September, I guess. As, uh, as the war, is the war over when you got No, uh-uh, it was still 45, 1945. I was three months COG, uh, past my enlistment, I know that. What's COG mean? Convenience of the government. Uh-huh. So, I got on the train there and went back across the uh, country and went to Camp Pendleton. And uh, we trained there for a while and uh, they decided uh, they were going to hit Okinawa. We were on the beach, ready to go aboard ship, and this officer stepped up on a, unit, on a platform and he said, you men that have been overseas before, said, fall out to the left and get your sea bag out of the stack. Well, we, we assumed that we was going into a raider battalion or something, you know, from our experience, but they took us back up to Camp Pendleton. Three days later, I went to uh, Oceanside for discharge, so I, so this is really um, um, that was about September of 1945 that I got discharged. Okay, so September uh, the war was over then. Well, yeah, they had the D Day and all that stuff. Yeah, um, I mean the E Day or V Day, V Day, V E Day, yeah, V J Day, V J Day, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it was all over then, you know. So, out of the original men in your in your um, regiment, regiment was how many? Six of us came home. Out of how many? Two hundred eighteen. Two hundred eighteen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got to feel real special. Please. You got to feel real special to have been blessed. Yeah. To oh, I was I was lucky as cat. Yeah, nine uh, lives. Yeah. Do you uh, do you recall any of the guys that you served with over there? I know two two of my buddies that I went through boot camp with, named Martin and Wetford. Uh, they were killed on Bougainville. Oh. Well, I was making I was trying to run down the exec officer and the captain uh, to get this move into the pillbox area. The first sergeant and the gunnery sergeant was running the company, and they were, I swear, uh, sorry to say, they were in a shell hole. They wasn't coming out, you know, all the shit was hitting the fan, and they was straight from the beach and all that stuff. And uh, so the first sergeant said, Bill, you know where uh, the captain and the exec officer are? And I said, yeah, they're in a shell hole over next to the beach here. He said, well, go over and tell them to come on up here because we're going to organize a, a sweep, you know, to go through the pillboxes. So I went back and found them down the hole. And I, I stand on the hole. I said, would you gentlemen mind accompanying me back to headquarters? <laughs> they didn't like it very well. But I was a I was a snotty ass kid, you know. I I didn't give a damn for sunshine or not. <laughs> I think that's what got me through, because I I was I was playing cowboys and Indians, you know. That's what I, what it was like to me. Uh, so, had you been home yet when you got discharged there? Had you ever been back home yet? Uh, I had to delay a furlough, delay 
in route from San Diego to Paris Island. I went home for 29 days and I went back to Paris Island. Yeah. And, and then I was when we reassigned went, and went aboard another train and went to San Diego to Camp Pendleton. Yeah. Now, is that, when, did, when did your mother find out that you hadn't been killed? When I went home on that delay. She didn't know about it until then? Well, she didn't know what it, well, I, when I got able to write, I could write her a letter. Okay. And she knew my handwriting. Yeah. So she knew I was alive, but. It, that had to uh, be a real traumatic on your mama. Yeah, her and my sisters. I got off the train in Augusta, and it's a small town, and everybody knows what's going on. And uh, my kid brother was in the sixth grade. He come running up. I didn't even know him. I hadn't seen him for almost four years. And uh, he come running up and said, you know, ran up to me and said, hi, Bill. And I said, uh, you, are you Jim? And he said, yeah. So we went back to school. And uh, he had the same teacher that I had in the sixth grade, Miss Marty Thompson. And I dropped my sea bag in the hallway and went in with him. I said, can Jim go home and rest for the rest of the day? And she said, well, sure. So uh, I said, "You, Jim, you go ahead and alert everybody that I'm on my way. And they come running up the street, my sisters and mom. had to be an emotional day for her and you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. No, no. That's all right. But everything worked out. So you you got discharged on September the twenty sixth, nineteen forty five. Right. And at Oceanside, California. At Oceanside. And then mm -hmm. What did, you, did you catch a bus home then, or a train? Or? Yeah, I uh, well, I actually tried hitchhiking <laughs> home, but I got to the Mojave Desert, and a sailor had been standing there for three days trying to get a ride. So he said, a Greyhound bus stopped, and I said, I climbed on, I said, can I get a ticket at the next stop? So uh, I went, uh, rode the bus to Spanish Forks, Nevada, and got off, and, tried to hitchhike some more, you know. I wasn't having much luck, so uh, I rode a bus as far as uh, uh, Oklahoma City. And I stayed over there, I stayed there two days and a night. Uh, I met some young lady that was willing and uh, <laughs> so I stayed a while in Oklahoma City and then I just took the bus on in to Cincinnati. Then I rode the train back up home. Have you stayed in touch with anybody that you were in the Marine Corps with since the war? No, I, I keep watching the obituary columns in the, the, the uh, American Legion and the DAV magazine that I get. Mm -hmm. But I haven't recognized anybody. So did, you ever, I guess, did you ever go to any of their reunions or anything of that? No, thing? I know they were having them, but they were so far away. Uh, the last one that, that the, uh, uh, I guess, part of the third division, but it was in California, and I didn't really want to go down that far. So, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you a strange thing. Now, I I went back in the corps in '87. What year? 87, uh, 47, I'm sorry, yeah. 47. I went back in the Marines because it was just, it was nothing in Augusta, you know. And uh, so I went down, re-enlisted. <laughs> and I was walking down the street, Broadway in New York City. And this guy went by and he eyeballed me and I thought, you know, maybe he was gay, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know why he was giving me such a stare, you know. And he walked about 20 feet down the street and turned around and came back. He said, 
and your name black? And I said, it certainly is. He said, well, we was in the 3rd Marine A Company together. And I said, well, I'll be damned. I can't remember his name. I'll be damned. But you can imagine walking down Broadway in New York City <laughs> and a guy comes up to you that you had been in service with. What were you doing in New York City? Just eyeballing a great big, you know, I was a country boy. I was up there just checking out the skyscrapers and Empire State Building. Where were you stationed at there? At, uh, well, I was at, uh, at that time I was in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. Oh. Uh, I got bumped around pretty good because I, I got into it with a sergeant and uh, <laughs> he uh, tried to give me KP. I got out of that because I had a, a swelling in my groin. He said, well, this ensign, you know, a young ensign in the Navy, he said, what's that uh, lump in your groin? And I said, well, it could be elephantitis. He said, well, what the hell is elephantitis? And I said, well, it's a disease they get down on Samoa. Well, <laughs> he said, well, you can't handle food with something like that. So he wrote unfit for KP. I laid it on the sergeant's desk and he said, uh -huh. I said, okay, well, by God, I'm putting you on post eight tonight, which was a mothball fleet there in Philadelphia. You're going to be on post eight, and that was a walking post. No lights, it was blacker than the coal, you know, down there. And you had to walk at right shoulder or left shoulder arms, and about a quarter of a mile, and then you turn around and walk back. Well, I walked over to the guard shack. Now, see, this is after my, uh, this is my second enlistment. And I had, my uniform was absolutely spotless, creases, shine shoes. I was the epitome of a, a Marine. And I walked in the guard shack and I told this old sergeant, a gunner sergeant, I said, sergeant sent me over here, said, put me on post eight. He said, post eight hell, I said, you're, you're too sharp for that. He said, you're gonna be on post one, main gate. So I got a, White helmet and bizarre, uh, MP bizarre, and uh, 45. And I was escorted out to the front gate and I relieved the guy. And I'm standing there at parade rest, you know, watching traffic go by and what have you. And this gunnery sergeant was NCO of the day. And he walked up. <laughs> He said, Black, my God, I told you to go on post eight. I said, you, you go over and argue with the sergeant, the uh, guard. I said, he put me here. So after next, I think it was about two days later, he called me into the office. He said, I can't handle you, but I can sure as hell ship you out. I ended up in Quonset Point, Rhode Island at a submarine base. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, uh, I had uh, developed a, a parasitic condition in my stomach. Uh, it was from some kind of a damn insect, that insect down in Samoa, you know. And so I went to the hospital in Newport, Rhode Island. And they had, they used me for a guinea pig. They'd run every damn test on me you could think of. It would be positive, negative, positive, negative. And I, I went in, the one time, and I told this doctor, I said, I'm getting kind of tired of being a goddamn guinea pig, you know. He said, well, we've been giving that some thought. We think the best thing to do is medically discharge you. He said, now, if this develops, it could be fatal. He said, so you can't stay in the core. The uh, uh, best you could do is just go home and hope that it don't happen, you know. So uh, that's how I got out my second enlistment. When, when was that second enlistment up? 47. 47. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, if you would, then uh, where were you at when they did, uh, physically when they decided that you should be medically discharged? In Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island. <coughs> And what was the date of your discharge that time? Uh, I, know it was, I only spent 10 months in that enlistment. Was it still 1947? Yes. 
What rank are you then? PFC hash mark. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, I was in charge of B barracks, so with sergeants and corporals there. Uh -huh. I uh, uh, hash mark PFC in charge of a barracks with lawyer, you know, with uh, sergeants and corporals in it. I, I don't understand that. No. <laughs> but that's why that I was short one day. The new guard and the old guard came out of the same out of B barracks which I was in charge of. So there was only two men left. When they trooped out, they grabbed wet swab and they were swabbing that area. So I took my shirt off, laid it on a bunk, and helped him, you know, clean up. And the sergeant come in, he said, who's in charge of this barracks? And I said, well, I am. He said, well, what do you do with a swab in your hand? And I said, well, short-handed. I said, I don't have enough people. He said, you're supposed to tell them what to do, not show them. I said, that's bullshit. I said, if you, if you need to be, help somebody, you help them. And he said, you know, he got huffy about it, and I told him, now Sandy's, but you know. So that's the guy that shipped me out to Quonset Point, Rhode Island. <laughs> he said, I can't handle you, but I can ship you out. <laughs> uh, so. Tell us a little bit more about your experiences in New York City. Well, <clears throat> we used to go up there. You're still single, right? You don't have Yeah, any... I had. I didn't get married until I was 28. Yeah, so you don't have any girlfriends or nothing? You're... No, I just scouting your territory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know the one, one thing we did, it was stupid, we didn't know. We were in the Empire State Building on the 105th floor. And we took pennies and shine. they just had a concrete, used to be just a concrete wall around that observation platform. Hell, you could fall off and you go 105 floors down in 37th Street or somewhere. In fact, a lot of people committed suicide off of it. Mm. That's when they built a fence up around it and put a dome over it so you couldn't get out. But we were shining these pennies and flipping them out watching them go down. If we didn't realize if that penny hit somebody in the head, it would have killed them. Yeah. Falling 105 floors, it was probably gaining pretty good. Well, that was part of it. But the we was there on a Sunday, and the building was shut down more or less. And the the express the elevator was going from the ground floor to the 87th floor. And you could imagine getting on that thing and it takes off and your knees bend and you you can't even straighten up, you know. You hit the 87th floor and the door opens and you walk out and then you walk up a flight of steps up to the observation tower. But coming down, you got on and you never seemed like a gain, you it never got your feet on the floor of the elevator. When that thing was just like it dropped off and under, you know, and you just, 87 floors express. And that thing was falling like a rock. Good that was that was quite an experience. I can imagine. Um, so, when you got discharged, then your second time around, did you come home right away? Or yeah. Uh -huh. You come back to Augusta. Yeah. And uh, what did you do with yourself? Then? Well, uh, the VA was asking for people to work at the Veterans Administration office in Louisville. So I went to Louisville, and I worked for the Veterans Administration for one year, and uh, they advertised in the uh, Courier Journal for a police recruit class. And this guy that I was working with, he said, let's go down and take that test. I said, well, I don't want to be a policeman. He said, well, you couldn't pass it anyway. I said, bullshit. So we went down there. He didn't pass. But I did, and, and, I made the, and I made the the I uh, went to the Southern Police Academy and uh, graduated second in the class of 34. I was the best shot in the national. <laughs> I was the best. I was top shooter. Now, where is that uh, located? Where you went? Louisville. In Louisville. So you're going to go on to the city of Louisville's police department? Yeah, I, I, I worked two years for the police department. I see. Uh, now. Are you still, were you, at this time, are you still bothered with this 
no. mysterious disease or whatever it was? No, it just it, it was it was actually probably negative, and they just didn't know it or something. But uh, they they told me I couldn't stay in the cold. I see. So you stayed on in the police department down there for two years. Two years, and then I. You have any problems while you were on the police department? Oh yeah, quite often. I was a badass. <laughs> uh, I can, that's why I asked you the question. <laughs> well, we had a call one night. The guy was after his neighbor with a shotgun. So we went down there and bailed out. And the guy took off running and he fell over a wheelbarrow in the yard, dropped his shotgun and, I, you know, I collared him and I got him between the two buildings and he ripped my partner's badge off of him and kneed him in the crotch, you know. And I nailed him. I, and then all he had he had a bunch of teenage sons. And they came out and got all over me and I was just knocking right and left. Uh, and Stormy was in pretty bad shape because he'd been kneed right where it hurt, you know. And uh, uh, so on the way, we had these old 41 Fords with the jump seat in them, you know, and uh, just single door. And this guy, we had this guy in the back of the cruiser taking him down, and he put his feet against that damn seat and pushed me right into the windshield, just kicked me right up against that damn windshield. Well, I told Stormy, I said to my partner, I said, go down by the flood wall, I'm gonna talk to this dude. I took him down, I just kicked the shit out of him. And uh, so next morning we had to go to court on it, you know, and we were out getting ready to get in the cruiser to go back on the job. This guy come walking out of the courthouse and he said, hey Slim, I want to talk to you. I told Stormy, I said, I'm gonna knock at somebody's on his ass if he comes over here. Well, he got about me to him and he said, I want to tell you something. If you come down to arrest me, said you blow the horn and I'll come out and get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the situation it was. <laughs> but we were trained by the FBI in our gun course, you know, the walk to walk, you know, with the pistol and a shotgun. And uh, he said, this one guy named a beaver, I remember his name. He said, You old boy from Kentucky can sure shoot a shotgun, can't you? I said, Well, if you grow up with one in your hand, you must. My, you learn pretty good. So he tried to get me on with the ATF squad, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and a uh, firearm. Mm -hmm. And I had to have, I could have two years of police experience and two years of college. So I went to the University of Louisville and uh, for two years it's majored in accounting, about the driest subject I think you can take. I went back and they had to raise it back to a full degree, so I wasn't going to take two more years. Of accounting to get on the ATF squad, and I'm glad I didn't because shortly after that I came back to Northern Kentucky, where I um, Dayton, Kentucky, and I was looking in the Sunday Enquirer and in wanted ads. They were advertising for an engineering clerk at uh, Thomas Emory and Sons over in Cincinnati. He owned the uh, Netherlands Plaza and the Terrace Plaza and the Crew Tire. So I went over and applied and got it. And what'd you do for Tom? Uh, was it John Emery or Thomas Emery? Tom Emery. Thomas Tom Emery. What'd you do for them? I was an engineering clerk. I uh, I did all the uh, book work on the uh, steam consumption, air conditioning, and stuff like that. And uh, when'd you start to work for them? Uh. It was probably about, uh, let's see, 50, about 51, mm -hmm. 1951. And uh, uh, my wife was a, a, a waitress in the uh, cafeteria, my future wife. She was a knockout, nice little, little girl, you know, and it was two or three guys hitting on her, you know. And, I walked in there and I, she was sitting there at the table, her lunch break, and I sat down, started talking, and these girls said, you don't want to go out with him, you don't want to go out with him. 
and because she was naive, very, very, you know, very quiet person, introvert, wouldn't say crap if she had a mouthful, and uh, I was just the exact opposite, you know, I, and I never met a stranger, and uh, so we started. To, I, she, they was having a waitress ball down at the uh, Cincinnati. A building down there that they just remodeled uh, the music hall. Music hall. Yeah. And she had two tickets to the waitress's ball, and she said, "Would you like to go to the waitress's ball?" And I said, "Well, hell yeah, I'll go." So three months later, we were married. All right. What's her name? Betty Miracle. Betty Miracle. That was her maiden name. Yes. And how old was she at that time? Nineteen. Nineteen, and you're what? Now, Twenty-eight. 28? <laughs> uh, I see. And uh, where uh, was uh, where was Betty from? Harlan, Kentucky. Uh, Black Star, one of the mining towns. Mining, sure, there. yeah. And, uh, and uh, so I was. They knew these other girls was older, and they knew what I was after, but I didn't get it, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, but anyway, <laughs> so, you, so when did you all get married, you and Marilyn? In uh, January the 19th, 1952. 1952. Where'd you all get married at? At Newport, Justice of the Peace. Justice of the Peace? Yeah. And uh, uh, then you had to wait three days. You had to take a blood test and wait three days for um, your marriage license to be approved. Mm -hmm. Had Beth sitting on the this gurney. They took blood out of her and she fainted. I caught her before she hit the floor. But uh, she was, she just, <laughs> when she saw that blood coming out of her, she just fainted, you know. And what'd you call her? Beth. Well, her I, name was Marilyn, but you called Betty. her? Betty. Betty? But that was my name for her. And then uh -huh. after that, she didn't want to be called Betty. <laughs> she wanted to be called Betts. Beth. Yeah, uh, her family didn't like me at all. They knew I was pretty much of a, a gadabout, you know. And she where, was. Where was you? Where did you all uh, move to? Well, we lived in uh, uh, Price, uh, Upper Price Hill, uh, up near the uh, park up there, Sailor, Sailor Park. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I forget that. I think that's what it was. But we just rented uh, a two-room apartment, bedroom and a dining room, kitchen combination. Now, did your wife stay working at? Uh, yeah, she worked there at the cafeteria. Maybe three months and got pregnant. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> and I told her she had to quit. Yeah. I didn't want her working. And you were she still. She fell. She fell. Oh. She was carrying a tray of dishes, and the water, or the floor was wet, and she fell. And I said, "That's it. You don't work no more." Uh, and you're still working at Thomas Emery, the mm -hmm. uh, company. Uh, so, uh, did she uh, have the child? Oh yeah, we uh, in uh, uh, November of '52. To yeah. So we didn't waste much time. What was it, a boy or a girl? A girl. And what'd you name the girl? Susan. Susan? That's the oldest girl. I see. Oldest child we have. How many children did y'all have? Six. Six? And how many? Four uh, girls and two boys. Uh, what's their names? I'm going to put you to a test here. Susan and Bill and Bruce. I thought I was going to have all boys after that, but then I had Teresa, Marisa, and Ramona. I see. And, uh, where did you, uh, how long did you uh, continue working for uh, Emory? Well, when I when she had to quit working, I was on salary, and I wasn't making a, you know, I was decently paid, but wasn't enough to really support a family. Uh huh. So I asked for a raise, and uh, my boss said sure. So Rem Remington Ryan came in and ran a survey. And they recommended me for a $200 a month increase because, hell, I was doing engineering work and I'm just a clerk, you know. Mm -hmm. So 
Thomas, uh, I mean, uh, Hartung was the superintendent of the two hotels. He went on vacation and he was gone for a couple weeks. And I told Dick, Dick Norton was my boss, and I said, Dick, I can't work here uh, on, on my present salary because I said, now I've got a wife and a baby, beginning of a family, so I've got to get some money. And uh, he said, well, uh, Hartung's on vacation. He said, you stick around and he'll be back. And I said, no, nah, I'm just going to start looking. So I went to Washi Electric. Who? Washi Electric on Vine Street in Cincinnati. And uh, I walked in there and this old machine shop foreman was a big Italian guy, Tony. I don't know what his last name was, but he said, well, what the hell makes you think you can be a machinist? I said, well, you've got a bunch of other goddamn dummies doing it. I said, I, I'm not, I said, I'm smarter than the average bear. So he said, I like your attitude. So he broke me in on every piece of equipment in that plant. And I was his utility man. If a person took off, I could go run a damn planter. I could run a, a mill. A, lathe, balancing machine, I could do, I could do it all. So uh, I was making good money there. It was a union shop and I was making, I was probably making seven and a half an hour or something like that and that was pretty good money back then. And we was working all the time we wanted. We could work Saturday and you know, I got into maintenance and hell I was working me like six, seven days a week in maintenance. And I was making pretty good money. So they had a reduction in force, or if they called it, I was a new kid on the block, union shop, out the door. So I went to Murr Tool and Die. Who? Murr, it's called Murr, M-U-E-R, mm -hmm. Tool and Die. Right. And I walked in there and uh, I said, I want to uh, learn to be a die maker. He said, well, are you, what experience you have? I said, well, I worked in the machine shop for about two years. I said, I could run anything in the shop. So he put me on and uh, I made a couple sets of dies, you know, and we were working six days a week, 10 hours a day. Shit, I was making money hand over fist, you know. All of a sudden, bulletin board, we will be back to 40 hours a week. Well, you take 30 hours of pay out of your check. There's no way. Mm -hmm. So I bowed out again, you know. And see, I went to Dover Corporation out on Spring Grove. And I was uh, what they call a uh, uh, supply room. Uh, I ran three supply rooms to the uh, to the Dover, production line, you know. Dover was an elevator company, wasn't no, it? No, it was, they made the radios and things in tanks. Oh, okay. Uh, I know Dover Corporation uh, is an elevator, but this is Dover Corporation out on Spring Grove Avenue, way the hell out there beyond. Uh, uh, past Winton Road. Yeah, it's past, uh, it was past uh, cons out there. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and what do you make there? Uh, well, they made, uh, you mean at Dover? Mm -hmm. They uh, made the radios and things, and they had a lot of capacitors and stuff like that. And uh, I was supplying the three assembly lines out of my storeroom. And uh, that was Union too. And they went on strike. I couldn't afford to be on strike because we had, I'd had the second child already my oldest boy. So I, I went, got another job. I said, I guess, uh, where in the hell did I go? I think we moved to Kentucky right after that. That's what it was. And I was living in Silver Grove and I went to work at the steel plant out there in Wilder. I worked there seven years. It was Newport Steel. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
What did you do at Newport Steel? Well, I went through the whole gamut, through the whole plant, and then I was promoted to foreman. And uh, the general foreman had a heart attack. He was off about seven weeks, and I ran uh, three damn different shops my way. And I had the guys whistling and singing. He was a lieutenant in the Army, this general foreman. And he almost expected you to stand at attention and salute him when he walked in a damn shop. That's that's his attitude, and that didn't work with me. I I was I had done damn near every job in a damn steel plant, and uh, I knew what could be done and what was expected. And I, I was humming, man. I had I was getting uh, production that was out of sight, and. Uh, uh, he came back, this former came back, and he called me in the office, started chewing my ass out. That didn't work. <laughs> so he went to Hart, to the uh, uh, superintendent of the plant. And he said, I can't work with Black anymore. Said he threatened me. I, I told him I'd knock him on his ass. Just flat out, I told him, I said, don't get personal with me, because I'll drop you. And he said, you're not working here anymore. I said, well, I was looking for a job when I found this one. So they took me before uh, superintendent. And this guy had been there about 20 years, you know. So uh, this guy said, uh, well, uh, I'll offer you a position back in shipping, be a shipping foreman. And that was on right on the Licking River. And, uh, wind blew right up your butt, you know. It was cold and hell back there. And I said, I don't think I want to do that. So I went home. I was living in Silver Grove. And lo and behold, there was an advertisement in the Enquirer for a, a shop teacher at the vocational school. So how I could teach them kids every, every damn machine we had in there, you know. So I went to Mr. Markham, who was the, bar, the superintendent. I said I'd like that job as a, a shop, for, uh, as a, a teacher in the uh, machine shop. And he questioned me on my capabilities and everything. He said, "Yeah, I think you'll work out fine." So I, I taught vocational school for two years in uh, Northern Kentucky, and uh, I was working as a teacher and then I was doing a, a government subsidized upgrading three days a week, three nights a week. I was teaching adult education and I was making 18 bucks an hour at that job. Which, what year is this now would you say? Please? What year is that? Uh, 64. $18 19. an hour? From Uncle Sam. You're doing quite well. You were uh, well. That supplemented my income from the. Well, I was work, I was teaching on a, on a certificate. See, I didn't have a degree, mm -hmm. so I wasn't making a whole lot uh, teaching vocational school. But uh, the upgrading class was. I was making more there in three nights than I was. Yeah. Uh, the whole week, you know, teaching school, and well, that fell through. And I, there again, I had, by that time, I had six children. And I said, no, shit, I can't make it on teacher's salary, you know. So uh, I went to, uh, went to work for uh, Tri-County Industries. Uh, they did uh, heavy insulation in different plants around Cincinnati. And uh, I was shotgun for them crew leader and uh, we did a lot of maintenance, you know, implant maintenance and then we did a lot of installations. What was Tri-County? Uh, Tri-County, it was a guy by the name of Winslow was the owner. Uh, he had a situation with a divorced wife and he remarried and she was mistreating his two daughters so he literally kidnapped them and they went to Canada. His dad took over the job, you know, the, the Tri-County, uh, the office work, and he was, well, he, he was really illiterate. He, he just didn't know how to handle office work. 
he was waiting for the phone to ring, you know. He wasn't trying to get out and dig up jobs like uh, mm -hmm. his son. So uh, I could see the handwriting on the wall, and I just bowed out of there <clears throat> and went to Astro Container and I worked out there as a uh, tool and die maker repair plus maintenance. And a friend of mine that had worked for me in Tri-County, he had started working for the city as a me mechanic down at uh, MSD. And I met him one night at the bowling league and he said, Bill, why don't you go to work for the city? And I said, well, why not? So I went to work for the city and worked 15 years there, retired. When did you start to work for the city? Uh, it was about 1970, uh, 71, I guess. And you worked there 15 years and retired? Yes. What did you do for the city? I was, well, I ended up as a building inspector. I started MSD, mud, shit, and debris. <laughs> Uh, it's a metropolitan sewer district, right? Yeah. We call it mud, yeah. shit, and debris. <laughs> you grew, grew some awful big tomatoes over there. Yeah. Well, I I had the, uh, there were six mechanics, so-called mechanics, working there. But four of them would make a helper. Yeah. I don't think I knew a box in from an open end, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I could read plans. Uh, I could read, you know, my chronometers and everything. So they got to, when they started making these, putting these jobs out, they would just hand me the plans and say, cut to fit, you know. Do, so I, I was doing real well, and, I, and Jack and I was the only mechanics they had. The other four guys was, they didn't know shit from apple butter. Right. And uh, so while I was working there, uh, the city had a bid system, and I saw uh, a bid on the uh, bulletin board for a building inspector. And I said, well, hell, I'll go down and take the exam, you know, and the guy said, the guy there said, ah, if you don't know nobody at City Hall, you ain't going to get the job. And I said, well, it didn't cost a damn thing to go down there and take the job. Yeah. Well, there was 150 applications for that two positions they had open. And I finished second in the whole city. And I got the job. So I worked 13 years with the building inspection. Yeah. And you retired what year from the city? Uh, 69, I think it was. No, it had to be later than that. Didn't you start there in 71? I think it was. So you retired in what, uh, 89? 89 is what it was, yeah. yeah 1989. Yeah. yeah. And uh, at the same time, I was in the uh, Ohio Military Reserve, uh, and I had to retire from them at 67. That was mandatory retirement. And uh, I'd worked up through the ranks. I started as an E-5, and I worked up to a major. I got a commission from the, city, from the state. Now, w did you go to, uh, was that uh, the reserves? Yeah, reserve, yeah. reserve is what you really. Uh -huh. And how, it often, was a how often did you go to cadre outfit? We went every summer to AT. Mm -hmm. We went to Camp Perry, and uh, then when they tore Perry down, they uh, we went over to uh, uh, the big Air Force base up there. I can't remember. The right, Patterson. It was up near. It was, it was near on the lake. Uh, Rickenbacker. So Oh, Rickenbacker. Yeah, yeah I went sure. to Rickenbacker. Yeah. Now you, um, that's an Army Reserve unit, not a Marine. Right. Yeah. And what rank are you in the Army? PFC. PFC also? In the Marines, yeah. Well, you, you stayed the same rank when you went in the Army Reserve? Well, they put me in as an E-5. Okay. And uh, I worked up to First Sergeant, and one year at Perry, uh, I tell you another experience up there. Uh, a messenger came down to the Quonset hut that, that I was quartered in. He said, Sergeant, uh, the old man wants to see you up at headquarters. And I said, Well, what did I do now? You know, <laughs> I was always into some crap, you know. Yeah. So I walked up there and there was four officers sitting there. 
I walked in and, and saluted him. You know, in the, in the army, you don't have to have a helmet on, a uh, hat on. Now, in the Marines, you don't salute in in more inside unless you're under arms. So anyway, I walked in and I saluted him and I said, Sergeant Black reported, sir, and he said, Black, he said, we, me and the other fellow officers here think you'd be good officer material. I said, you do? <laughs> so I went to Bigler in Dayton uh, about three weeks, three weekends, and was commissioned a second lieutenant. And then I worked up to, I ended up battalion commander with the 41st Infantry in Cincinnati. What at that, you at the up? armory down there on Reading Road. Yeah, yeah. So, right there on Reading. Uh, what rank did you end up being as, in the reserve? Major. Major. Did mm -hmm. you retire? At, yes. At, at also? Uh, it, was, it wasn't a paid retirement. You uh, got paid for your travel time and the time you were at AT. I see. Uh, but uh, it was, they, they got a new uh, <clears throat> uh, district commander and he said, I was a captain for hell about four years. I was more than in, in rank the whole time. So when the colonel retired from uh, uh, the 41st uh, division down there, he, uh, they was going to appoint another commander, you know. And he said, uh, he came in and he said, uh, he was going to appoint another captain, you know, uh, to, the, to the major's spot. I said, well, you know, I've had damn near four years in grade as a captain. And why why am I not being considered for a battalion commander? And he said, "Well, I didn't realize that, Black." He said, uh, "I didn't know you'd been captain for four years." And I said, "Well, time in grade, if nothing else, you know." And I still think I'm a pretty damn good commander, you know, because I uh, I was on a rifle team. I won trophies at Columbus shooting and all that stuff. So uh, uh, I, I thought I deserved to be battalion commander. It worked out pretty good, but uh, then at 67, you got to retire. They won't let you be in there any longer. So I retired. I still, I have a, my uh, ID card, I can get on any base in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. Just when I went back to Paris Island, I, I showed the sergeant at the gate my uh, ID. I handed it to him, and he saluted me. <laughs> yeah. Said, "Walk up aboard, sir." Okay. Handed me my damn billfold back, and uh, I, me and the wife drove on the base over at Paris Island. Ran around all over the place. It was strange, though. I hadn't seen it. And, Many, many years. Um, is your wife still living? No, she's died. She's been dead 10 years. 10 years. Did you remarry? No. No. And, uh, I didn't even get anybody to move in with me. Yeah. My daughter said, Dad, why don't you get somebody to move in with you? I said, because I don't want nobody in here. Yeah. I got two cats, my buddies, and uh, we just batch it, you know. Yeah. And grandchildren? How many oh grand Lord, I've got twenty. Let's see, eighteen grandkids, and twenty-eight great grandkids, and two great great grandchildren. My goodness! Oh, gracious. we we. I ain't gonna ask you to name them all, right? Oh now. Lord, I don't even remember their birthdays or anything. I, yeah. I I have to look at them once. I say, now what's his name again? <laughs> now there's a couple of them that I know real well because. We go to Golden Corral on Sunday morning, like for breakfast. Yeah. Uh, my uh, daughters, my youngest daughter's two sons, live here in Cincinnati, and they uh, they each have now. John has two children, two boys, and Brian has one. Wow. Now you, I know their names. You've got great great grandkids. That's five generations there. That's that's wonderful. Uh, at this point in the 
interviews, uh, I'd like to ask Jack Sinking and Brian if they have any questions they want to ask you. Jack? This well, is, I want to say that it's been a real joy to get to know you. And uh, I'm probably one of tens of millions of Americans who understand that we're free because of them like you. Well, I appreciate the compliment. But I have a question, too. You got me about 15 years. You're in better shape than I am. How in the world do you stay so young? I have no idea. Doctor said if he could bottle it and put it on the market, he'd make a million. You know, incidentally, and this we don't want to dwell on this, but your doctor is my doctor, too. Dr. Dr. Scale? Dr. Scale, yeah. Yeah, he was the first one I was in contact with at Christ. Yeah. See, I had this valve replacement, aortic valve. Yeah. And, uh, and how old are you right now? 94. And you just had the aortic valve replaced? He said, we don't normally offer this to a 94-year-old person. Right. He said, but with your uh, physical being, he said, you're, uh, you have the physical uh, abilities of a man about 65. And he said, uh, I don't think you'll have any problem with that. I wouldn't all. want to tackle with you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've been... And you just got out of the hospital. I've been overly aggressive all my life. I mean, I just never felt like taking any shit from nobody. Well, you had the right not to, what you went through for our country. You had well, right I think it to. changed my philosophy of living because uh, I was fairly religious previous to my combat experience, but I don't think you can really enjoy killing some son of a bitch and still be a religious person. I, I just, I can't comprehend forgiveness for that. Now, if you have remorse, uh, then there might be a chance for, you know, redemption. But I don't, re I don't have any remorse about it at all. In fact, I, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> well, you were in a situation where you had no choice. Kill or be killed. That's right, Bill. That's exactly and, uh, right. And people just don't believe how sharp your goddamn senses become. Now, you can believe it. Uh, I don't care if you do or don't. I could walk through the jungle and I could smell all those Japanese. They had a musky smell like an old cedar chest or something, you know. And I say, boys are close by. Cause he said, how you know? I said, I smell them. He said, oh, black, cut that shit out. I said, well, I'm telling you, the hair raises up on the back of your neck, you know, and you, when you're smelling these people. And uh, bigger and shit, we'd walk around and bend in the trail and there'd be three or four of them sitting around a fire, you know, cooking their meal or something. But I'd lay in a foxhole. I put banana leaves over the top of it to keep the rain out, you know. And those leaves would dry out. And believe me, I'm not lying. I could hear piss ants walking on that, on those banana leaves. Uh, that your your senses were just outrageous, you know. Your sense of smell, your sense of sight, and just a general feeling, you know. And uh, I was pretty much of a, a gung-ho Marine. I mean, damn, I just didn't believe in. I, I wasted a lot of ammunition, but I gave a hell of a lot of them the coup de gras, but yeah, I just didn't take no chances. And. It didn't bother me. I never had any flashbacks or anything. I, I was to me, you. I just closed the door when I left the Pacific and started a new chapter in my life. That's all. I didn't, uh, didn't you know, bring it with me in any way. Well, as Dr. Scale said, you're a remarkable man, physically <laughs> and mentally. He, he, uh, he speaks so highly of you. Uh, Brian, what about you? Uh, why did you join the Marines? Why not another new uh, branch of service? I thought it was the greatest in the world. I mean, how were you? 
Yeah. Please. Did you have much exposure to Marines before you joined? I mean, no. You saw them in movies or something? Well, I, I see them, you know, in uniform, and uh, I liked the uniform. I thought it was pretty sharp, and uh, and I my understanding was at that time that they were the greatest military outfit we had. Well, now they're second or third on the list, probably, because you got the special forces, you got the the uh, divers, the uh, Navy uh, SEALs. Seals. Mm -hmm. uh, they get a lot more training than we did in Paris Island. Did uh, Augusta, it's a small town, where there, there were a lot of guys end up serving uh, during the war? Well, <clears throat> two of the guys that I went to high school with was killed on Iwo Jima. And we got a VFW post up there named after them. Maines and Quinlan. Was Charles Maines and Gene Quinlan? They got they got killed on uh, on uh, Iwo. Did you know them? Were they close to the age of you? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I was wondering if you were you were trained on the, the uh, on your, your rifle, the uh, oh three, yeah. The, um, what did you think about that rifle? The rifle that you had, the weapons that you had. Did you the M1. Yeah. Well, I got when I went from the uh, 03, I got a carbine, a little 30 caliber carbine. See, I was in headquarters company. Uh, the first sergeant, uh, clerks, and you know, there was about six or eight of us, you know, communications, all that shit. So I was a jack of all trades. I did a little bit of everything. A mail clerk, I, I ran messages from, from my company to battalion headquarters, uh, just a little bit of everything. And I, I was trained in semaphore for signaling, and you know. And meanwhile, while I was on Samoa, they advertised for uh, rear gunners for the TBF squad that was there, and I was a qualified expert in the service, you know, in the Marines. So they uh, you offered. Talk, you're off talking about a TBF, a, tor a torpedo bomber, right? And uh, I went to the Morse code shack for about three weeks. There's no way I could comprehend da 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 and all that shit. I, I just couldn't make it. So I, I was in line to be uh, in the Navy, attached to the Navy as a, a rear gunner. You missed and, that part in our story before. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Me, me, uh, while I was on Samoa, I learned to speak Polynesian. I could talk to him just like a, a native. And uh, it came in handy a couple of times. That's why I always wanted to meet Munoz. I bet I'd have knocked his socks off with a, with a Samoan <laughs> greeting. Hello from my woe. Means hello, my friend. And uh, uh, he would uh, probably fell over in shock, you know. He was probably on Samoa when I was there. He's probably. a football player for the Bengals. Yeah. Uh, for the people listening, yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, when you got shot, like, the first time in your chest area, I mean, did you realize that you were shot? I mean, was it real, I mean. Well, I was standing there uh, looking around. The guy, there was a couple of guys, you know, on either side of me. And the one guy said, why well, don't see no Japanese? I said, well, don't worry, you'll find them. About that time is when I got knocked down the hill, you know, and I said, it, it feels like somebody hits you with a ball bat. It doesn't hurt. Uh, I didn't hurt for about two or three hours, you know. But I knew I'd been shot because the blood was spurting out of my chest. And that's when I put my thumb in it. And uh, so I laid there and played possum. And then when the firefighter died down, I tried to sneak down the hill and got shot through the shoulder. And uh, so I rolled down the goddamn hill. And I got to the bottom. <clears throat> There's a little gully there. And I was laying in this gully. And I knew that if I didn't get some help, Pretty soon, I'd probably expire, you know. So I said, "Well, 
I guess I gotta get out of here, so I just got up and walked back to the beach. I mean, did you feel, uh, you weren't panicked at work, or were you, did you feel No, like I thought I heard the angel's wings, but, uh, <laughs> but I didn't get too excited about it. Uh, pissed me off when he shot me through the shoulder. <laughs> like kicking me when I was down, you know, if he was in a fight. I said, he's slaying out, son of a bitch, you can't kill me. And I got up and walked back to the beach. <laughs> Sit down, I couldn't move. Oh, <laughs> Paralyzed, all the adrenaline had exited my body. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I... Uh, so you said the medic put like salt on your wound? Sulfonidomide sulfonid powder. Oh, right. It's a it's healing, it's a coagulant. Right. And uh, yeah, the, the corpsman came up to me on the beach and put the bandage on my shoulder, on my uh, chest, and he put one on my shoulder. But you could, the bullet was lodged under the skin right here on, on my breast. You could, it's, it's you could actually, there, right? you could actually feel it, you know. So both bullets are still in you? No, he, they just took a scalpel and slit that thing and lifted it out and he gave it to me for a souvenir. I still have it. Yeah. Does, you, does yeah. you still have a bullet in you on the other yeah, side? Yeah, it stands behind my hip. Mm -hmm. It slid, it, it never moved, it just isolated itself. The doctor told me, he said, if we take it out, we'll have to break a couple of ribs to get in there and all that stuff. He said, uh, uh, Private Black, he said, you've got two choices now. We will take it out if you want it taken out. He said, but believe me, it's not going to bother you. It's going to isolate itself and, you know, it, it, it will never move like shrapnel or something. Uh, these are pretty horrific wounds that you got, yeah. uh, and they were going to send you right back into combat again? Yeah, for trying to whip the corpsman over my beer. <laughs> I knew every day. He said, you're ready for combat, I'll send you back up to Guam. And uh, I'm still leaking from my hole in my chest. And I, I've heard it all. I said, I told him, just like, I, like we're talking, I said, well, I don't give a goddamn where you send me. I can handle it. I was just having my attitude, you know, and he said, next, I think, about two days, me and two other Marines were back on a damn ship going to, back to Guam. I was, it took a, quite a while for that to heal up. Yeah. Did you uh, talk much, when you came back to the States after the war, did you talk much about your experiences at all? Oh, I told the kids. Uh, my son, my oldest, youngest son, he's he's been always been interested in my war stories, and uh, a lot of people don't talk about it. But me, I'm just the opposite. I don't I don't have any uh, hallucination about it or anything. And uh, it was just something that happened, you know. And uh, that's the way I looked at it. I mean, it was an experience. I wouldn't. Wouldn't want to do it again, but I uh, don't regret being in the Marines and in the combat area, and it's just part of my makeup, you know. <laughs> um, were you on honor flight? Yes, two of them, actually. One in Georgetown, I, we went out of Dayton uh, Airfield, and then uh, this last one, uh, they called me and I was one of the few, there was only three World War II veterans on this flight that I was on. We're just getting scarce. Uh, Jack, you got any other questions? No, no, it's just an amazing man. Um, I think if we went out here on Pine Street and asked a hundred people to guess his age, I don't think there'd be anybody over late 60s. <laughs> well, how many uh, medals did you get? Uh, Just a Purple Heart and a cluster. And uh, how many clusters? One. One, so that yeah. means that you got two then. Two bullet holes in a shrapnel. And they, they didn't give you one for the shrapnel? 
Yeah, that's see the, the, the two. Oh, that's three, isn't it? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. they uh, they considered the shot in my chest and my right shoulder as one because it happened within ten minutes of each other. Well, I, you ought to correct him on arithmetic. Yeah, well, uh, I appealed it when all the way back through the DAV, and uh, it was re refused. Uh, you know, I just wanted the recognition, you know. Right. But uh, I didn't get it. I'm you, not worried about it. I mean, no, <laughs> I, I know that. I'm just making a little joke there, but a sorry one I might add. But uh, is there anything else you want to share with us today, Bill? Uh, let's see, I, I had something I was going to tell you about um, on Samoa. We, uh, we were getting ready to go to Bougainville. Uh, we, we had been lined up for Bougainville. So they issued us two, two grenades apiece, and some of them were orange. And the Marine Corps never, they always improvise. So we had to take green paint and paint the damn grenades green if you had, if you got the orange ones. So I had an extra one. And I, I unscrewed it, dumped the powder out, broke the fuse off, put it back together. And I pulled the pin about halfway out of the damn thing. And I walked in the tent and I tossed this grenade on the bed on a bunk and I said, who's got the paint? And there's some replacement. He said, let me see that. And he, like a rattlesnake, he said, God damn it, pin's almost out of that thing. So I acted very excited, you know, grabbed it up and pulled the pin out and that boom went boing and there was nobody left in the tent but me. <laughs> I could have been court martialed. <laughs> uh, but I was always pulling shit like that. <laughs> Crazy ass punk kid, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, it's, it, it's guys like you, though, honestly, and I'm, I mean this sincerely, it's, it's guys like you that our country is, in a, is as great as it is today is because of men like you make the sacrifices. And, well, I hope it. And I contribute. You're unique that you were able to... Uh, not to let it affect you like some men do with the PTSD and yeah, I and uh, I I feel so sorry for these. I mean, I, I'm just you know throwing it out, but I so feel so sorry for the Vietnamese soldiers right. that fought in the v Vietnamese War. They got very little recognition, right? And uh, the the country just kind of said, well, you know, bullshit, you know. I was really sorry to see that. And this same thing happening in Iraq and other right. places over. These young men coming back with legs missing, arms missing. Yeah. That makes me so sick. Yeah. I, I really get sick at my stomach when I yeah. think of all the... They're just, as, they're just as good as you folks were. And, uh, and we're lucky to have them. We're lucky for the whole breed of guys like you and the men that we got serving our country today. Well, Bill, I guess this is about the end of the interview, and it's at this point that I <laughs> want to thank you for the interview. Thank you. And I want to thank you for your service to our country. Okay. It means so I, much. I did it willingly. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad. <laughs>